Hi everyone, my name is Jim Weber and I'm Chief Scientist at Neo4j and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about data structures and algorithms. So uh, for many of us, uh, a blast from the past, from our university lives, uh, but actually as a DBMS designer, a DBMS engineer, uh, these kind of things are fundamental uh, to the way I do my day job. Um, so let's have a chat about some um, of the fundamental things that we call from university, starting with the humbly, humble singly linked list. Now, uh, a linked list is actually quite a, 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 an amazing little data structure. Uh, we take it a lot for granted because they're so uh, you know, easy, so trivial, but they have some really, really great properties. They maintain an insertion ordering, which can be pretty useful. But importantly, the cost, the algorithmic cost of inserting to a, to a linked list is 01, constant. So it's the cheapest possible way uh, of inserting into a structure. That uh, property is actually very useful if you've got uncontended uh, heavy write insert load. The flip side of, uh, of linked lists though is they're not terribly good for reads. The property of the list structure is that as the list grows, it takes longer to read that list. So we say that that is ON because uh, the complexity, the cost, uh, scales linearly with the number of elements involved. But we could take a list, we could take one of these you know, singly linked lists and we could put a box around it and we could stick an API on top of it and it would become a database. A, a, admittedly, a, a modest database, but a database that would be quite competent for uncontended writes and not terribly good uh, for reads. But for data where you expect uh, you know, a single thread to write a reasonable amount and you rarely expect to, to read or you don't mind paying an occasional relatively high cost for read, with something like maybe uh, web server logs, this would actually become uh, a reasonable database. In fact, uh, the, uh, the choice of data structure uh, enables us, makes us native, if you like, for that style of database. So let's come uh, uh, let's explore a little wide, more widely in our field of data structures. Often when we've finished with things like you know, uh, lists and uh, arrays and so on, the next thing that we encounter at university level are trees. Now trees are interesting, right? I'm, I'm only an amateur arborist. The, the, the literature on trees is uh, enormous and deep and rich. But generally speaking, trees as a, as a family of structures have a, a similar kind of uh, operational affordance, which is they, they give us logarithmic cost access for both reads and writes of data. What this means is that as my data set size increases by an order of magnitude, the penalty that I have for reads or writes uh, to that tree structure uh, only increases by a single operation. So uh, if I have uh, a tree of order of magnitude, uh, a million elements, that might only take me uh, six or so steps to, to write or read a particular element in that tree. Ditto at a billion elements, it will be approximately nine steps to write or read an element in that tree. Now trees are pretty fundamental to database people. In fact, uh, many you know, classic database uh, designs are, are formed around uh, uh, B trees, uh, where we have a, an in-memory index uh, over some potentially uh, slower storage tier uh, for our database records. And so the nice thing about the, these tree structures is they, they're well understood and they give us reasonable cost access for reads and writes. And compared to our singly linked list, they're also able to spread write contention around the structure. You've got more points where you can attach new data in a tree versus the single point of attachment for the linked list. Now, Neo4j itself uses some trees, use some trees for indexing, but we don't use them very widely in Neo4j. And there's a reason for that. That is, if we're trying to uh, imitate a graph traversal through a tree, each access to one of our records costs us log n. And at large values of n, uh, it costs us quite a lot to hop around the graph. It costs us log of n. In Neo4j, we prefer structures that are cheaper than that. So while we could take our tree structure, we could draw a box around it and we can add an API onto it, we could create a database. That database resembles a modern document store. It is absolutely a fine trade-off and indeed is native for storage and retrieval of document structured data. It's not quite uh, ideal for what I want to do in Neo4j, which is to be able to traverse around that data at high speed. Okay, so so much for trees, pretty, pretty good. Nice balance of reads and writes, uh, less contention. Uh, another structure that we often come across at university level are hash maps. And the lovely thing about hash maps is that they are O1. 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, cost complexity. They are uh, uh, constant time access for reads and writes. So the, we all know the, the hash map structure. I have a key that references some value. Very, very simple, uh, straightforward structure to work with. So its affordances are good for developers. But uh, hash maps also, a good hash map has uh, a design which is explicitly there to spread data around. So we have a good hash function which ensures there are few clashes in that hash map. Now classically that's a good thing uh, because I don't want uh, uh, two data items to, to clash for locality. I want them to be spread around so I don't get any of those clashes and my structure remains performant. In my world though, in the graph database world, uh, actually spreading data around uh, reduces uh, spatial locality. So actually when I'm trying to traverse a graph in Neo4j, uh, if I'm at one node and I want to traverse to a neighboring node, it's far more efficient mechanically in terms of memory access if those two nodes are adjacent to each other in memory. Perhaps they're in uh, the same uh, page in the page cache, perhaps even they're in the same cache line in L2. That can be uh, uh, very, very uh, performant. If, however, the good hash function has done its job, the chances of those two neighboring nodes in the graph being next to each other are, are slim because we'd like to spread them uh, around the entire hash space. So given those three structures, you know, we, we, we can see that, you know, if you recall, we, we could create a, a simple uh, write-oriented database with our lists. We can create a, a classic document database uh, with our uh, trees. We could create a, a hash ring based database with our hash map. And each of those, those fundamental data structures, uh, give rise to a particular native model for those databases. And in fact, they empower those databases to be, to be particularly good at what they're designed for. In Neo4j, we have to take a slightly different approach. Uh, we have to uh, pick and choose our uh, data structures and algorithms to suit graph traversal, a uh, high performance graph traversal. And to do that, Certainly we do have some lists, certainly we do have some trees. Uh, in particular, we use our trees to provide indexes in our graph so that we find starting points in graphs very uh, affordably. We use lists uh, in, in Neo4j for those scenarios where we have relatively modest amounts of data and we want high write performance, so Neo4j's property change are a good uh, example of that. But when it comes to storing the graph, we choose quite a different model. In fact, we choose to separate data from structure and we have a fixed uh, sized pointer scheme for storing our graph data. What this means is that our graph traversals are always order one. They are pointer size multiplied by offset. It's an O1 computation, which means that I can hop across my uh, a a relationship in my graph at algorithmic cost O1. Mechanically, that's also very cheap. This is simply pointer chasing, which is something that computers are very good at. Ultimately, it means that my traversal performance in Neo4j is order m, uh, order n, which is uh, uh, n order one operations. It's the uh, sum of all of the traversals I perform in order to find my information goal. And thus, the uh, latency of my query is proportional to how much of the graph I choose to explore. It's not proportional to the overall size of the graph which can be very large. So I hope that demonstrates somewhat uh, the way that we're working in Neo4j, the way that we understand that certain data structures provide uh, uh, empowerment for certain data models. The structures we choose in Neo4j, we choose to empower our native graph model. Structures other databases use to empower their native model are different and also well considered. But when you're choosing a, a, a database, particularly one to process graphs, I think that you'd be well served to choose one that selects the underlying implementation to suit a graph workload. So thanks for hanging out today. It's been a pleasure to uh, revisit some of these uh, uh, computer science topics with you and see you in the community soon.